I always say to people, have you ever locked yourself in a room for four hours and just played John Coltrane? It kind of does something to your head. That was DJ and St. John Coltrane Church pastor, Wanika King-Stevens. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. In this podcast, Wanika talks about her life after she graduated from high school. Her band, Mystic Youth, went on to play more and more shows and do some recording. She also got involved with a new church that her parents had helped to found, what would later become the St. John Coltrane African Orthodox Church. Wanika shares the history of the Uplift radio show on KPOO, which she DJed for two decades until just recently. She ends the podcast with her outlook on San Francisco. Here's Wanika. Well, we were we were gigging pretty heavy uh, in the Bay Area, um, playing um, festivals and universities, and we recorded an album eventually. Um, that was all of our original music and it was the album was called best wishes Mm -hmm. um and we came up with the name best wishes because um we had all of these autographs um that um were gathered from our airport ministry Mm -hmm. um and so at that time, you know, it was nothing for Marvin Gaye to just come strolling through SFO and he would see our booth out at the airport and come over and talk to us and give us an autograph. Wow. So we had all of these autographs from like the Bob Marley and the way not Bob Marley, but the Whalers, mm. Rita Marley and Marcia Griffiths, um, Twisted Sister. <laughs> Bill Murray, just like all of these folks, right? And so we put the uh, autographs on our album and we called it Best Wishes. Love that. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way for folks to hear that record now? Like, is it on Spotify or any of that? You know, we. I I just noticed that you can do that. I didn't realize that you could do that. So Mm -hmm. I think it would be a good idea to put put it back up and make it available but okay. you can go to youtube and uh love shall rain is on there okay yeah and that's a beautiful one actually one of our um our arch priest who's no longer with them god bless his soul um father robert haven we call him blue water or blue for short uh he plays tenor saxophone on mm. there and his solo on love shall rain is one of my favorite solos of his yeah, wow, it is pretty, pretty nice. Yeah, I will. Is. I will listen to that, and if gotta I gotta listen to it, figure out a way to to let our listeners listen to it. I'll, I'll include okay. That. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that you played bass. Did you play stand up bass? Not until later. Okay. Not until later. You played um, like a like a hold, hold it on out here I, with a strap. I totally confiscated my uncle's um, bass. Yes, Uncle Ron. He was a merchant marine at the time Mm -hmm. and um, would go to different places and come back and he'd have all these wonderful trinkets from Mm -hmm. around the world. And he came back this one year with this beautiful base and um, this black case and you open it up and it had the plush green velvety inside inside with this lovely um, black body, uh, shiny Yamaha bass. It was a Fender copy, mm-hmm. with rosewood neck. It was mm-hmm. just gorgeous. And, and before he left, he said to me specifically, don't touch this. <laughs> That was his first mistake, exactly. right? Exactly. That's your invitation exactly. to do more than touch Exactly. Yeah. So, of course, you know, after about, I don't know if it was a week or a couple of days, but I, I couldn't, just couldn't take it. So, finally, I just picked it up and took it in my room, and you could play it with headphones at the time. So, mm-hmm. I, I, I was just kind of picking around on it. And um, one day, like, I started thumping out a tune, and I, I could start doing things rhythmically on it and then something that you created or that you, yeah oh, okay. it was actually like my first song Ja Rastafari which is on that song on that album rather okay and um I um was messing around with it and um all of a sudden while I'm playing thinking that I'm by myself my door goes flying open 
my dad jumps into the room and points at me, aha! <laughs> Busted. Yes, I heard you, I heard you. And I was shaking. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. I'm not supposed to be touching this. Mm -hmm. and, and then I realized, wait a minute, he's jumping up and down and laughing. Oh, like, what's going on? And then he just starts going, you have to play that. You have to yep. play it. And so, yeah, so that was it. I was like, I was free and clear at that point. Yeah. Yeah, so are I you, could play and take some lessons. <laughs> I was going to ask, are you self-taught or did you take? I, well, for a while I was. I yeah. was just kind of going at it. And then, um, and then my dad got me some lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started taking lessons for a while. And mm -hmm. then I decided, well, uh, City College is not far from here. I'll just hang out there for a while. And I hung out there long enough to get an associate's degree in oh. music. Okay. Yeah, I took a bunch of classes. Awesome. Um, what was really helpful, I think, was uh, David Hardiman, uh, Mr. Hardiman's uh, jazz improv class. Okay. So I took his jazz history class and his jazz improv class and Kwaku Daddy's um, African drumming class. Mm. So that was really helpful. So I got to play with other people, learn something about rhythm, timing, um, and improvisation. So that was good. Did, did you, at that whole time, did you think of yourself as a bass player or a musician? Or I think you said you were kind of a band leader. Like, how did you think of yourself as you're taking classes and learning more about music and learning more about your own relationship to playing? Yeah. You know, I think at that time I thought of myself as a, as a songwriter. Mm. Um, and the bass was my tool. Right. You know, it mm -hmm. helped me um, to uh, come up with um, ideas with, in terms of writing songs and stuff like that. So... I think the bass player part came later um, when I could see that I was able to not just do my own thing on the bass, but I could actually go and mix with other musicians and, mm. and play something outside of my comfort zone. Um, and so I think that that makes you a bass player. Yeah, you versatility. Know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and that was great. And uh, Father Haven had a lot to do with that, too. I mean, he would always say he was playing jazz, you know, and Afro uh, high life and all, you know, all this stuff. And mm -hmm. he'd always try to get me to go on one of his gigs and play. And, and he was a composer himself. Mm -hmm. And he had his own style of music called water music, okay. which was free. He's blue water. He's blue water. Blue, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who um, anybody that you talk to playing music in the Bay Area, they know blue. Yeah. And um they might call him Roberto or something different. Mm -hmm. He had many names, mm -hmm. but we called him Blue. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he had this style of music called water music that was free. Mm. And that was really foreign to me. And he, he would be like, Monique, I love your bass playing. Just, like, come and, you know, play on this and play on that. And, and I would go, Blue, I can't play on that. What, uh, you know, because I'm coming from rock steady, you know. Mm -hmm. Time, <laughs> and, uh, si time exactly, signature. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just, it was difficult for me. Yeah. But um, he kept pushing me and kept pushing me. And, and it was a good thing because um, I realized um, a certain freedom in the music and being able to play the instrument um, that I don't think I would have discovered uh, just playing it. So my style then became very, very different. I had this sort of solidness coming from, you know, coming from playing uh, pop reggae music. Mm -hmm. And then um, Jimi Hendrix was my hero. Um, and so I kind of had that little flavor going mm -hmm. with me anytime I could like get some Jimmy on there mm -hmm. it was it helped me it made sense mm -hmm. and then to try to be free and I honestly I feel like I'm still working on that right you know lifelong yeah exactly journey yeah how do we get from there to and and pardon again my ignorance but which came first your own work as a minister and then the radio show so the radio, the radio show at um, KPOO Radio, which is, you know, 
amazing within itself. It's mm-hmm. the only African American owned radio station of its kind this side of the Mississippi. Absolutely. And um, it was a very special place because people that we know now, like a lot of the hip hop artists that could not get any radio play, who are all like you know highly respected now mm-hmm. in in the in the music business. Um, that's where they got their start. Absolutely. As at KPOO Radio. And it's the first place that I was able to hear my album on the radio. Oh, wow. yeah. And I mean, that's really special to a kid when you can hear yourself on the radio. Yeah. It, it opens up possibilities. It makes you think that something's possible here. Mm-hmm. So uh, KPOO is... Um, the, the work that they've been doing is just tremendous in terms of reaching out to the community. And, of course, it's it's everyone, the Arab American community, uh, the LGBTQ community, the Native American uh, community. They are the voice of the people. Absolutely. And we're so lucky to have them. Do you remember what year it was that you heard your song on KPOO? Well, again, roughly- that, that had to be... That had to be I'm thinking around 81 or something wow. like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was right there. It. And I mean, and you think about this, Jeff, for a minute here in the Bay Area, we had people um, like uh, um, my brother's name is um, it's I'm losing his name right now. But Humpty Dumpty, we just lost, lost him. Shock G. Yes. Yep. Yes. And Tupac was mm-hmm. over in Marin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had all of these E-40, Too Short, short, all of these folks. We were all right here um, doing our thing. Uh, Different circles, different circumstances and situations. Mm -hmm. But um, it was all of that was happening right here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And so our thing was coming out of the Coltrane Church. and, And I think that's what really made it possible because we were the youth of the church Mm. um, growing up so our drummer was a part of the church uh, percussionists and background vocalists and we would take some of the young people who would come through um, and somehow just work them into what we were doing you know (laughs) into the music and so it was this sharing thing um, a, a process to allow people to grow and discover themselves and to be a part of something that was, you know, working like a force of energy. (laughs) It was kind of amazing. Can you uh, talk about how the church got started? I don't think a lot of people know that story. I certainly don't. Right. So, well... Was your family involved? It, it is them, yeah. basically. Okay. Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, so it's it, we, would, we would have to go back to the Bayview. Okay. And um, that's where the listening sessions would begin. Um, so they would sit and listen to music. And this really came from my uncle, who um, I'm going to dare to say on tape, my favorite uncle. Oh, sorry, all y'all others. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <Yeah. No. laughs> Was this the uncle with the bass or a different no, uncle? No, he didn't play bass, but he loved music. Okay, got it. And um, everything uh, was jazz to him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember one time being a kid and we were watching Saturday morning cartoons and the Sugar Bear commercial mm-hmm. came on. Can't get enough of them sugar crisp, <laughs> you know. Yes. And, and he just loved that song, yeah. right? And it was jazz. Mm-hmm. And, and the way he would sing it, I could feel it, you mm-hmm. know. And um, so, yeah, he, he was definitely um, an influence. But his thing was to our family community was that the kind of music you listen to is the kind of person that you are. Mm. So he was always very deep that way, you know. And so you start to think about music differently and what you're listening to, what you're feeding into your mind, into your system, the vibration and the energy that you're taking in becomes a part of you, just like the food that you put in your body. It's right? spiritual. It, it's spiritual. What, yeah. yeah. And it's just, I mean, it's just, a, I don't know, just a very primal kind of thing. You know, it, you don't, you can be spiritual or don't have to be spiritual, but you are affected mm-hmm. by what you listen to. And, and if you think about it, 
for me, I'll just say for me, some music that I listen to makes me ill. Mm-hmm. I just, I can't listen to it for mm-hmm. very long. Mm-hmm. And then some music is so healing mm-hmm. and just so calming. And so there's all these different kinds of music for different things. I think what my um, uncle, Landris Charles, Uncle Shanghai Lo, <laughs> would say is that um, jazz was an elevated music. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, we have people like Duke Ellington who said the music is not jazz. It's not an adequate label. Hmm. And then John Coltrane said, well, if you want to call it anything, you can call it classical music because it's the music of the individual contributor and the composer. Hmm. And and that's, that's really a lot more accurate definitely um so that means there's a certain intentionality Mm -hmm. that comes with the music right Mm -hmm. it's not just oh let me put these three chords together so i can have a hit and make a lot of money right Right. (laughs) this is like no i have a concept here Mm -hmm. and um well our spirits aren't formulaic yeah our emotions aren't yeah Yes. make a template for that stuff you can't so you can't sense. but music certainly is a for, is a formula there, right? right there are patterns definitely melody out. harmony rhythm oh, yeah. just that within itself what yeah. makes it music is is a formula and a mm-hmm. pattern right mm-hmm. so yeah um so how so, do we go from listening parties to yeah so that's <laughs> so that's right thank you that's that's the early part of the church that's how it started okay listening it wasn't called a church though okay it was just a listening clinic right and we a listened okay. and so i can remember being a kid and my dad putting on something and going who's on trumpet hmm. and Got to listen. It's like, oh, that's Miles Davis, you know. To and just know it without You have to know it. who's on trumpet, who's on the drums, who's on bass. So you, you start to learn a player by their sound mm-hmm. because everybody has a sound. Everybody's making a contribution, mm-hmm. right? So that's the dear listener. Mm-hmm. So then when John Coltrane came out with the album A Love Supreme in 19... It, well, he recorded it in 64, but it came out in 65. Mm-hmm. And he said, dear listener... All praise be to God, to whom all praise is due. Let us pursue him in the righteous path. Yes, it is true. Seek and ye shall find. Only through him can we know the most wondrous bestowal. That was quoting Jesus. Right. And um, my dad was really thrown back by that. Archbishop Mm -hmm. King, he just said, nope, no more John Coltrane. (laughs) Right? That's the end of that. (laughs) But after a while, uh, he realized, hey, dear listener, that's me. That's mm-hmm. who, who he's talking to. Mm-hmm. And then there was a deeper investigation, long story short, into John Coltrane and what he was trying to do and trying to say with the music. And out of that came the understanding that um, the music needed to be played in a different place. Mm. It, because uh, John said the music is rising and we need another place for it to be played in. And so that's when One Mind Temple came into um, fruition and One Mind Temple um, Body of Christ. And there was just this whole evolution of names within the church. And ultimately the St. John Coltrane African Orthodox Church when we became a part of the AOC in 1982. And John Coltrane was canonized a saint. So that was really sort of like midpoint. Right. Mm-hmm. When this whole African Orthodox Church and St. John Coltrane and all of that came into being. So when you ask me what came first, yeah. it's a tricky question. Yeah. Right. Um, because the music, I guess the music came first. Mm-hmm. And then after the music, the understanding and then um, the spiritual journey and then the African Orthodox Church. The gathering. Yes. Yes. Yeah. When did y'all, you said your your place before this one that we're in right now was on Fillmore or? Yeah. Well, we started on the Visadero. Okay. Got it. That's where we started. And um, my parents um, found a storefront on on the Visadero in Oak, 351 de Viz. Mm. And um, they said, well, if we're going to be here, we can't just be a church. We have to serve the community. Mm. And so at that time, they started a, um, a seven day a week 
free vegetarian meal program oh, yeah. that was incredible and let me just tell you we have um, people who are like lawyers and people who work for the city who have contacted us and thanked us mm -hmm. for being there because when they were struggling and in college and <laughs> <laughs> didn't have any That's money. Struggling yeah, in college. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, right. um, they they were able to come to the One Mind Temple and Love get it. this really delicious home cooked vegetarian meal that was completely nutritionally balanced, served with love. And dignity and respect. Um, it, that was a great part of my growing up. I loved the food program. Yeah, that was the early 80s, you said? That was that was the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. I mean, we were there for probably well over three decades. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. When did you decide you wanted to be, um, and I'm sorry if I'm getting the terminology wrong, a minister, yeah. a, a the, the reverend. Right, right. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't, I don't think that I really decided it, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which is being honest. But when we became a part of the African Orthodox Church, Archbishop George Duncan Hinkson, my consecrating Archbishop, he came out here and made, um, made everybody a minister. So I was like 21 or something. And um, I was a, I became a deacon. Okay. Yeah. And so I was a deacon in the church. Was Mystic Youth still going at the time? Uh, we were going a little bit, but we were, I think we were kind of towards our last leg um, okay. because people were starting to grow up, go to college and stuff sure. like that. Things were changing or go to work. So, yeah, different lifestyles. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Now can we talk about Uplift? Yes, let's one talk of my about favorite. Uplift. I don't yeah. like to play favorites, uh, but one of my favorite shows. Oh, Uplift is Jeff's favorite show. Well, <laughs> what I mean is. Make sure you get that part in there. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, it's a, an amazing show. I absolutely Thank love you. it. It's how Thank it's you. how I first learned about you. Yeah. And met you. Yeah. Yeah. So, how did that get started? So that, that, again, goes back to about 81, 82. Um, my mentor at the time was Sister Nancy Sullivan, and she was the pioneer, pioneering host for the Uplift broadcast. Okay. Um, she used to host a show in Idaho, um, and she was the little red fox, I think, or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she had this long, beautiful red hair, and um, she... Um, yeah, so she pioneered that show okay. and, and taught me in, about radio and got the bug in me. Okay. Um, and then we had Sister Mary Deborah after that. And then after Mary Deborah was myself. When did you take over then? I took over, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm so bad at math. So my That's son okay. is 20 and I was there a year before he was there. <laughs> so around 2000. Okay, yes, yes. Just yeah. before 2000. He was born in 2000. Okay, got it. Yeah, so um, just before then. And it was, it was great. I mean, I sort of stepped into it. I didn't know how long I was going to be there. I just looked up and it was like 19 years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. still there. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you get out of doing the radio show I get to listen I get to listen and that is the best thing that is the best thing I always say to people have you ever locked yourself in a room for four hours and just played John Coltrane it kind of does something to your head <laughs> <laughs> something ultimately good <laughs> ultimately really really good You'll I mean get there. I felt like it gave me an opportunity to listen in a, in a really intense kind of way right. um and I really can't think of what's better than that, anything better than that. It's, and it, gave, it also gave me the opportunity um, to play for people. Like, I wanted, when I came in there, I really, really wanted to share my love of the music of John Coltrane with the listeners. And for the, the people who didn't get John Coltrane, I wanted to help them understand how to listen to John Coltrane. Because if you just pick up, 
you know, something from 19, um, if you pick up some John Coltrane from 1963, 64 or something, you, you might miss it, yeah, right, right? right? You might miss it. Right. Um, but there is a progression with John Coltrane's music. And you have to understand that progression, that he didn't just start out with sonship, you know, that you go back to the prestige years, you go uh, through Blue Note and Atlantic, and um, you work your way up into um, the years and when he was with Thelonious Monk, and then you get over into um, the, the impulse years, and even within impulse, there's a progression that happens, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I felt really satisfied um, when I did an interview with um, Dr. Nicholas Bam, who wrote the book, um, Coltrane Church, Apostles of Sound, Agents for Social Justice. Okay. And he wrote an article uh, in the American Journal. And in one of his interviews, there was a listener who said he was really grateful for um, the Uplift broadcast because Sister Wanika showed me how to listen to John Coltrane. Can you believe that? I was like, job done. Okay. No. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Validation. Not validation. Is it validation? It or is was, it, it's a good feeling. That's it was for sure. a witness. Yeah. yeah a witness. It was a definite witness. Mm. And um, it really encouraged me because uh, the music of John Coltrane is so special to me. I just love love his music and um you know i just i wanted to share that i wanted to share that with people awesome before we go to the last thing mm -hmm. uh, do you want to tell our listeners in your own voice when they can tune in yes every tuesday from 12 noon until 4 um at 89.5 fm kpoo san francisco you can listen to to it on the TuneIn app mm -hmm. and at kpoo.com. Mm -hmm. Now here's the kicker, Jeff. Okay. So um, my nephew, who has an incredible voice, mm -hmm. he has been hosting the show. Because mm -hmm. um, I've been away, I've been in school. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of hosts over the years that I've been gone. Um, but um, this young man is doing the show now, and I am going to be making my transition over to um, Coltrane Consciousness Radio Okay. at Live 365, oh. and you can listen to um, the music of John Coltrane. We're still bringing in our, um, our DJs at this time. Right now, we have Justin C. Brown on Saturday, 4.30. Pacific time mm -hmm. for an hour. That's so. That's our first live G DJ, and I'll be um, coming up with my show. That I'm not going to say the name of it yet because it's still <laughs> I'm still forming it okay. and everything. But that's coming up this summer. Uh, I'd like to end. We uh, we have a theme every season. Michelle and I on the show, yeah. and our theme this season. We're in our fourth season. Is congratulations we're thank you that's awesome thank you yeah 49 episodes a season uh, wow so we're yeah um our 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 season this year got started in march and uh -huh. you know we were trying to think about everything that's going on right obviously in the world but you know we're storied san francisco so what's going on here and we came up with the theme we're still here Ooh, that's a good one <laughs> how how would you respond to well, to that, but also just, you know, the changes that were, that, that predate the pandemic, certainly. Um, but given the pandemic and sort of, mm. you know, all the changes it's forced us to undergo. And now there's a glimmer of hope. We might be coming out of it. Yeah. Definitely not out of it. We're, we're kind of headed in a, in a good direction. I guess, I guess uh, another way of phrasing it as, you know, what are your hopes for San Francisco? What, what do you see San Francisco being in the near future? You know, we've been through so much in this city um, with the dot-com, with uh, even before that redevelopment, the dot-com, uh, gentrification. Um, the African-American community has been devastated by a lot of the changes. I think we're we're less than 5%, maybe 3% of Something the population. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so a, a lot of changes for us. Um, the pandemic, 
uh, just, you know, so many changes that affect us all. Mm-hmm. And, and so now here we are in, in the, um, in the midst of um, really having our eyes open, I think, as a nation. Definitely, I mean, probably the biggest thing is the George Floyd Mm -hmm. thing, um, where we get to really take a look at ourselves. We had Donald Trump as the president of the United States, another opportunity for us to see ourselves, Mm -hmm. not just blame one man, but to really see ourselves as a nation, who we are. I think the pandemic, I'm going to go back to the pandemic. I think the pandemic has been um, the most um, influential thing that I can see. Mm -hmm. Because what I see from it is that it's really shown us that we really are all connected. Mm -hmm. That the world is a heck of a lot smaller um, than we think. So if someone has... um, COVID virus in another country on another continent, it affects us all. And so we have a responsibility to one another. And so if you think about that globally, and then just sort of bring that into your own community, right? What responsibility do we have as San Franciscans to one another? Um, Is it all about just trying to get over and and be number one, which is, you know, fine, but um, do we have, you know, does, is there room for the question <laughs> mm-hmm. that perhaps we have a greater responsibility to our community as a whole? And how far does that circle go? Um, is it possible that we can begin to reimagine our society in a society where we don't have margins but where generosity and grace and um, you know goodness extends all the way to the the edge, you know, no borders, just all the way to the edge, where we just have a better city. And I I think San Francisco is the place where something like that can happen. And if we can do it first, and and I believe we have that in us, you know. Uh, we can be an example for for so many people in this country. And then ultimately this country has set itself up uh, as number one. And so we can be the greatest influence throughout the world. What brotherhood or what I like to call human unity really looks like um, and, and make some real changes in the world just to make the world better. Uh, that's that's what I'd like. I think that would be a better San Francisco, a more caring, um, and not to say that people aren't caring, but just that we begin to spread it out, really push ourselves. How far can we go? Kind of like doing the limbo. How low can you go? <laughs> you know? How high can you go? How high can you go is really, that's it. How high can you go? That was Winika King-Stevens. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, we'll get to know a past guest and friend of the show, H.P. Mendoza. Episode 11 drops next Tuesday. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have more than 150 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can, subscribe, rate, and review our show so we can reach even more folks. And if you'd like to drop us an old-fashioned email, we'd love that. The address is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.